Okay, so today we're going to be talking about why did the Europeans become more involved in Africa. And let me just make a small distinction. You'll probably be hearing some strange noises because there's more building going on in my house. But that's neither here nor there. We're going to be talking about why did the Europeans become more involved in Africa. And today's video is going to be mostly kind of reviewing ninth grade because we're going to be talking about how did the Europeans begin trading in Africa. So we're going to give a little bit of background um, to Europeans' influence in Africa. And so if we're talking about um, Africa, it's just a couple of things before we start. First off, the primary agricultural crops that you're going to find in the, on the continent of Africa would be things like rice, yams, onions, millet, cotton, and beans. Now, another thing to keep in mind as regards to Africa before colonization, and when we talk about colonization in Africa, you're talking about the late 19th century. So prior to the Europeans kind of exerting their power in Africa, we have, as I've written here, hundreds of ethnic and linguistic or language groups. Literally, in some of these countries that are today making up modern Africa, you have 75, sometimes as many as 200 different languages spoken within one country. So it's a incredibly linguistically, linguistically diverse continent. It is made up of many different religions. Mostly today, primarily, would be Christianity and Islam, and then a whole host of different traditional African religions. Now, Africa um, as a continent, even though the Europeans would might say that it's a strange place, has been trading with the Africans, excuse me, with the Arabs and the Europeans for centuries. Um, and Africa is a continent that was a series of smaller kingdoms, um, and a lot of these kingdoms had powerful armies, and the Europeans just didn't want to deal with this. But there was a lot of trade going on in Africa, strong trade networks controlling gold and ivory, and then, of course, um, the last bullet I have on this particular slide, the Europeans really could not get inside of Africa because the rivers are too difficult to navigate. You don't have navigable rivers. You have large plateaus that drop off, so you have these huge waterfalls, and it just doesn't make it very easy to get into the interior of the continent. Now, before we start going into more detail about um, how the Europeans begin, the, the main thing when you talk about how Europeans began trading in Africa, you have to kind of talk about the slave trade. Now, the slave trade, the height of the slave trade was 1500 to 1750. Now, trading in slaves was not something that was considered to be new in Africa. Uh, the Romans have been using African slaves since the 7th century. Um, and the Arabs, with their caramel caravans going across the Sahara Desert, carried gold and slaves northward to the Mediterranean in return for things like cotton, wool, copper, and brass. The eastern coast of Africa was integrated into Indian ocean trade by Muslim and Arab traders, and things that were being exported from Africa during the Indian Ocean trade period was gold, slaves, ivory, amber. Um, so there was a slave trade present in Africa prior to the Europeans. However, the Europeans are going to expand it greatly um, with a total of about between 9 to 15 million Africans being taken off the continent and sent to other places forcefully as slaves. Now, the Europeans who would have started the slave trade, at least on the western coast of Africa, would be the Portuguese. Um, and the Portuguese in 1498, Vasco da Gama, you might remember this from last year, set sail to find a trade route to India. And he began, they began to found trade, uh, excuse me, African trading cities on the Indian Ocean. Um, and they decided to try to conquer them. And because the Portuguese had better weapons, they were able to easily conquer these areas. So then the Portuguese also began sending missionaries um, to areas like the Kingdom of the Congo. Now here, the Kingdom of the Congo, Congo spelt with a K, is not the same as the country of the Congo today in the interior of Africa. This Kingdom of the Congo was on the coast of Africa. Um, but the King of the Congo actually converts to Christianity. He sends his son to a missionary school, and his son, Alfonso, winds up becoming uh, the King of the Congo. Now, the Portuguese were the ones, like I said, who really began to start the slave trade. Um, and they reoriented the trade routes of Africa to the Atlantic coast. And they would create large coastal fortress towns. Places like, hold on, let me get my pen ready. I'll write some of these down for you. Places like St. Louis, that you could spell, Cape Coast, Elmina, um, 
Anguela. Um, these are some of the names of these coastal fortresses that the Portuguese built. It wasn't possible for them to really get into the interior of Africa. So what they did instead, and this is Cape Coast Castle in West Africa, they built these huge, massive, like, fortified castles as holding cells. And what would happen is the Africans would bring gold and slaves to trade with the Europeans. So it was Africans capturing other Africans um, to be used in the slave trade. Now the number of slaves rose from about a thousand a year in 14, the 1451 to 1475 period, about a thousand slaves were captured per year, um, to 7,000 in the first half of the 17th century, to 50,000 a year throughout the 18th and first half of the 19th century. So I said the number varies between 9 and 15 million people that were taken um, to become slaves um, in the Western Hemisphere. And if we look at this map here, you see that the vast majority of the people that are being taken as slaves are going to the West Indies and to Brazil. Very small percentage, 5%, going to the southern United States. Vast majority, 60% going to the West Indies because of the large plantations that were set up there. 35% going to Brazil because of the sugar plantations there. And then you could see the small percentage coming here with the East African slave trade um, that was still present the whole time. Now, and here you can see um, people being inspected um, in order to be bought for slaves. So this man here, you can see he's inspecting the man's teeth. Um, you might have seen this in seventh grade. This is a depiction of what a slave ship plan, uh, plan was because the goal, obviously, of the traders was to get as many people as possible crammed onto these ships because um, that's where the money was. So they laid them coffin style. So they would be in these decks um, laying from head to foot. You could see here, this is considered the coffin position on board a slave ship, so they could pack in as many people as possible. They were barely given enough room to stand. Basically, the decks were about three, and a, three feet, three inches high. Periodically, they'd be allowed up onto the top of the deck for fresh air, um, because you could imagine the conditions were really quite horrific in the interior of that ship, with them just being three feet high, and you being having to lay... Um, next to people's feet, kind of crammed in as, as tight as possible, so a lot of people were getting sick. Um, so it was just unmanageable conditions. Um, here you can see uh, captives are being thrown overboard if they misbehaved or if they got sick, they didn't want illness to spread, so they would just toss them overboard, and sharks would follow the slave ships because they knew that there would be food, um, potentially food for them to eat. Here we see this is um, a depiction of slaves being taken in the West Indies. And here we can see how many slaves that were being sent um, to the Americas and the region of Africa. So the most were coming from the west coast um, of Africa. So the Portuguese um, are going to set up ports, like I said, in East Africa. Um, Angola and Guinea were early trading posts. They were governed directly from Portugal with no import from the input from the locals, which is different from what we see, say, in like India um, or in um, Indonesia. Slaves were sent from these areas to Brazil. Um, and like I showed you before, with the king of the Congo converting to Christianity, there was a lot of Catholic missions, uh, there were missionaries that were being sent to try to convert the people into Christianity. And then in addition, um, within Africa itself, there were rubber and coffee plantations, um, which they also utilized slave labor. So here we can see this is the notice of a slave auction in New York in the 17th century. And here are the slaves, the once they were bought by their masters, they would be branded permanently so that they could, if they escaped, they would know where they belonged. Um, and slaves, this I believe I showed you um, this particular picture when we were talking about Haiti, because this is, you could see the, all the whip marks on this man's back um, from being beaten over the course of the years. And... Here you can see this is the picture of a slave lynching. So if any slave stepped out of line, uh, quite commonly they would be hung in a very public manner as a message to the other slaves. Um, now this particular figure here, Oladuka Equiano, we're going to read about him um, in class. In 1789 he writes and publishes the interesting narrative of the life of Oladuka Equiano or Gustavus Vasa, the African. Um, this 
What we have from this man is a very rare first-hand account of what it was like to be a slave, because most slaves were not literate, but this man eventually gained his freedom and became literate. And not only do we have what it was like to be a slave from him, but we also have what it was like to be captured and brought across the Middle Passage, because um, he was brought directly from Africa, and he talks about his experiences um, as he was taken and especially ripped away from his family and his sister. And we're going to read about that in class. But... Africa is a center of huge amounts of natural resources. Now, during the 15th to 19th century, there were individual states that were taking shape in Africa. Now, if we look at Europe in the 15th century, the 1400s, we also see individual states beginning to grow in Europe. So it's a similar um, process that's happening within Africa. So the most prominent um, state at this point would be in this area, which would be the Songhai Empire, which was about the size of France or Spain. Um, that wasn't the norm, though, to have a state that large. You have a lot of smaller states, kind of like the size of, of Portugal or in England. Some other major city uh, states we see developing during this time period is the Oyo Empire, which was in... Nigeria, and then you also have the Congo in Central Africa. Now, the slavery, slavery and slave trade actually was very important to the rise and fall of these various different states. Land was not privately owned within these states. Slaveries were the main form of wealth. Um, these different states that were, involved, were around at this time period um, they would routinely go on raids, and they would raid rival kingdoms, and that's where they would gather up their slaves. Um, so the, the Africans themselves actively participated in the slave trade. The European traders offered new opportunities for them. It allowed African business to become African businessmen to become active in the slave trade, um, and they controlled the trade right up to the water's edge, right up to where these you know trading posts would be along the coast. It was the Africans themselves that were dragging the people into um, into slavery. Now, the European demand drove the increase in slave trade. Um, and the Europeans needed the Africans because they didn't have the military strength to get into the interior. They were not immune to many of the diseases and they had no knowledge of the terrain. So they stayed in coastal enclaves. Now, some African rulers did see the danger of this trade and they began to try to limit the trade, but there was too many people making too much money, and so that kind of encouraged the trade to continue. Um, so European sailors were pretty competitive with each other around the slave, because it wasn't just the, it was the Portuguese, but eventually the Spanish got involved, and the English got involved, and the French got involved. Um, and we start to see European port towns grow up, not just that of Portuguese, and we also start to see the growth of an Afro-European culture. So these European port towns are more what we call Af Afro-European. Um, now, in St. Louis, which is in Senegal, um, you have a very strong kind of like European-African culture that begins to develop um, in these areas. Now, here you can see, if you look at this map here, African trade between the 15th and 17th century, we see that there are other things besides slaves being traded, but if we look on the map, let me get to my pen, we'll see here, this is the symbol for slaves, and there's slaves here, 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 all over being traded, in addition to other goods like brass, copper, ivory, and all these other things that are listed down here. So... Now, in 1807, the British outlawed the slave trade in their country. And then what they began to do was attempt to forcefully end it by seizing other countries' slave ships. But the trade continued because the slave trips ships, even if they were from different countries, would cooperate with each other to avoid British capture. Now, the overall effect of the slave trade is disputed. Some scholars say that this was completely dire for the economy of West Africa and really harmed West Africa in the long run. Some, some historians will suggest that the trade was actually relatively small to the whole overall population of the continent of Africa and actually had very little economic effect. 
Now, one other thing to mention, though, before we finish talking about the slave trade, is that there was also a slave trade, like I said before, going on in the East, which is referred to sometimes as the Arab slave trade. Um, about 17 million Africans were sold to India, the Middle East, and North Africa. So the largest uh, slave market was on the island of Zanzibar in the town of Stonetown. And the main thing on the island of Zanzibar, which is off the coast of Tanzania, was, and I'll spell Zanzibar for you, was the production of cloves and various different spices. So Zanzibar, and this is Stonetown. And like I said, it's one of the largest slave markets um, in the world. And they continued because this was a huge boon in money. Now, if we look at this picture, this is a picture I took when I was in Zanzibar. This is a monument to slavery that kind of marks the spot where this huge slave market um, was once held. But so slavery definitely was a part of the way the Europeans began trading in Africa. And then we're going to see that there's going to be a stronger push for the Europeans into other parts into the interior of Africa, and that's what we're going to talk about in the next video.